A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Al-Fatihi Dima Uglik Wa Khatimi Dima Sabaq Nasr al-Haqqi bil-Haqqi wal-Hadi ila Siratika Mustaqeem Wa ala alihi haqqa qadirihi wa miktarihi al-Azim O oh Allah, we ask you to send your blessings upon our Master Muhammad, the opener of what was closed and the seal of what came before him, champion of the truth by the truth and guide to the straight path, and upon his family and companions as is befitting his noble rank. Ameen. Allahumma ya kareem akramna bi nuru faham wa akhrajna min dhulumat al waham wa la hawla wa la quwata ila billah. O Allah, the noble, the generous, we ask you to ennoble us with the light of understanding and to remove us from the shadows of illusion. And there is no power nor might except through God. Amin. And so this week, we're going to really do like the how-to, like the instruction manual for Ramadan. Like if you don't know how to fast, if this is your first time doing it this year, then this is going to give you the tools that you need to successfully fast. And then next week, we're going to talk about Ramadan again, inshallah, but we're going to do it more from the perspective of looking at the meaning of the month. Like, why do we fast? And we'll, we can't talk about it without getting a little bit into it tonight, but we'll really be like diving deep into like, what is this all about? What's the purpose of it? What does it do for us? How does it strengthen our relationship to God? Uh, all of that, inshallah. So to begin, um, as I often like to begin, uh, I like to look at the Arabic because usually it gives us some insights into like what the thing that we're talking about actually means. We translate it, we don't always uh, get a good translation. Sometimes bad translations become like really prevalent. And Ramadan is just a word that we don't translate. We take it from the Arabic. And we say it, but we don't necessarily have an awareness of like, what does the, this word actually mean? And so it comes from a root in Arabic, Ramada, uh, Ra, Mim, Dal, or Dad, excuse me. And it refers to like an intensely hot uh, situation setting scenario, something that is intensely hot. And the way that this root is applied when it's not talking about the month and the calendar year is it is also used sometimes to describe like rocky uh, desert landscapes where like the rocks are just like baking in the sun all day. And if you've ever been to a place like that, you know that like it's a completely intolerable like place to be. It's not where you want to be without some kind of shelter, a lot of water, um, some way to nourish yourself. Um, I, I was in Wadi Rum a few years back, and for some reason, well, I know why, I just happened to be in Jordan, and then my wife uh, came to join me after an Arabic program that I was doing there, but like it was in the middle of the summer, and we decided to go to the desert, basically. And most people who go to Wadi Rum, which is a beautiful, beautiful place, they wait until the winter because then it's at least like a seasonable temperature of like 90 degrees rather than like 120. Um, but this is like, it just feels like you're melting. It, you just, at the end of the day, you're just completely sapped of all of your energy. And so Ramadan is that month that is, it brings an intense heat into our life in the sense that we are burning away a lot of our sins from the previous year. In the sense that whenever we suffer, and this is true inside the month of Ramadan and outside the month of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that when we suffer, uh, even if it's something as minute as the prick of a thorn, um, our sins are being expiated by that. Like God does not allow us to suffer except that he's forgiving us for things that we have done in the past. So how much more so when we're purposefully depriving ourselves of food and drink for God's sake, how much is he forgiving us then, right? So this is a heat that is really sort of like just melt, like you think of it like an ice cube in that desert environment. It's melting away our sins like that. Um, and this heat, I mean, really, like, it's quite literal. If you've ever fasted before, you've, you've probably felt it. 
right? This, you get this burning sensation inside your body. And that actually has a lot to do with the way that your metabolism works. Um, your metabolism increases when you fast. Um, so your body, at least as you're adjusting to the fast, it does become quite hot. Like you feel hot, you break out into sweats. You are actually expelling toxins from your body. Aside from any like religious duties that we may have, it's a great thing to do for your health. It's a really great, people do it now. We call it intermittent fasting, right? It's like the newest, it's like keto was or the Atkins diet. If any of you are old enough to remember Atkins, it's, it's like the new Atkins. Um, Ramadan's been cool all along. It's just people didn't know it. Um, but what does God say about fasting in the Quran? Um, he talks about it in the second chapter called Surat al-Baqarah. And this first verse, I'm going to read you, you either have heard a million times or you will hear a million times. Um, and it's, Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum as siyama kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'alakum tattaqum. Allah says, O oh, you who believe, this is something that Allah says a lot in the Quran. He talks to a lot of different groups of people. He'll say, oh, mankind, oh, humanity, or he's talking to everyone. Sometimes he'll talk just to the believers. Sometimes he'll address the Christians. Sometimes he'll address the Jews. Sometimes he'll address the polytheists. So you know that whenever you hear, ya ayyuha ladina amanu, that he's talking specifically to you. He's talking to you as a believer, and he's letting you know something that as a believer, you need to know. Something that really you could consider to be essential to your belief. He says, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who came before you. Now, this right here has something interesting to tell us about Islam as a whole, right? It tells us something about the way that we actually understand our religion to um, exist, to operate. And that is that what Islam is doing, what this final revelation that God is sending to mankind is actually doing, is it's reviving something very old and very ancient. Something that has been with humanity for as long as humanity has existed. Something that may look different uh, given the time, given the place, something that throughout the course of history may have changed to some extent, but which uh, is this message of very simple monotheism that we've been talking about in previous classes. And that along with this message of very simple monotheism has come this prescription to fast. And this is actually something you can observe in the world, like find me a religion that doesn't prescribe fasting in one sense or another. I don't think you could do that. I, like, I don't, I certainly haven't found uh, a religion that doesn't have some form of fasting. Even uh, very sort of like modernized Christian groups, right? They'll fast Lent, which we're actually in Lent right now. Um, I know that because Wendy serves fish sandwiches during Lent, and I love it. That's how I celebrate Lent every year. Um, thank you, Christians. Um, the, I totally I just sidetracked myself there. What, what was I saying? Um, they, they will give up one thing as their fast, right? But what are they commemorating? They're commemorating when Jesus, upon him be peace, went out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and fasted and prayed, right? The Jews fast Yom Kippur, uh, the day that God forgave them, right? They do a 25 hour fast. Why not 24? Because they want to make sure that they, they definitely get like the whole day. So they do 25. So um, the Buddha fasted before he became the Buddha. He, he fasted a lot. Uh, find me a religion that doesn't have fasting. Um, this is something that God has prescribed for every people who has ever walked the face of the earth. And so what is he doing in prescribing fasting for us? He's reviving that. 
He's saying this ancient tradition that humanity has engaged in that has brought them closer to me since there have been people walking the face of the earth, you're going to do that too. It is prescribed for you. Engage in it. Do it. La'alakum tattaqum. That you might attain taqwa. Taqwa uh, is this great word in Arabic. We, we translate it a number of ways. My favorite is God consciousness. Um, but taqwa really means having a keen sense of awareness of something. Uh, like if a wolf walked through the door, God forbid, we would all have taqwa of that wolf, right? Because we would <laughs> be wondering, what's it going to do? Is it here to eat us? Is it here? What is it going to do? Is it rabid, right? We would be moving to the sides of the room. We would have our attention fixed solely on that wolf. That is taqwa of the wolf. We're called to taqwa of Allah, to be conscious of our Lord in that intense way at all times, right? And what God is saying is that Ramadan is something that I give to you. It's a gift and fasting is prescribed for you so that you can actually attain that state of consciousness of me, right? Ramadan is a tool and a gift and a really profound practice that inshallah, uh, you know, if this is your first time or if it's one of your first times fasting, really like just wait and see what it does to you because it is amazing. It's amazing, really, like, even if you're not fasting, like if you're a person who can't fast, um, but you come into the community during the month of Ramadan to just see what it does to people, right? Because we all become the best versions of ourselves. Um, but that's kind of getting into the meaning of the month. I'm going to save that for, for next week, inshallah. So notice how God is talking in this verse. He says, it is prescribed for you. Literally, it is written. Like, I've written it down. Like, the ink is dried. Like, you know, it's like you signed the contract. You've got to do it, right? And so, it, in a way, it sounds kind of daunting. It's like, if you believe, like he's talking to the believers, if you believe fasting is prescribed for you, got to do it. Now, pay attention to the next verse because he flips on you a little bit. And this is something else that really characterizes this religion. He says, fast a prescribed number of days, but whoever of you is ill or on a journey, then let them fast an equal number of days after Ramadan. For those who can only fast with extreme difficulty, compensation can be made by feeding a needy person for every day not fasted. But whoever volunteers to give more, it is better for them. And to fast is better for you if you only knew. So God, I'm not going to say God changes his tone, but he, he does something with us that he very often does with us. This is like a theme that you may notice in the Quran where he lays out the rule. He says, this is the ideal. This is the standard that I want you to shoot for. But I know you have weaknesses. I know that you have physical frailties. I know that you get sick. I know that you have exceptions that come up in your life. So here's all the exceptions that you can take to this rule. And I've said this before, I'm saying this based on my experience and my level of knowledge. I'm not going to say that it's hard and fast. Don't take it as an absolute. But in my 16 years of being a Muslim, I have found that in this religion, we are not absolutists about anything except the oneness of God and the prophethood of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when it comes to our shahada, our testimony of faith, right, we don't compromise on that. Like, that's what we believe. You believe in that and you're a Muslim. You don't believe in that and you're not a Muslim. That is the door to the religion. But once you walk through that door, everything else has exceptions, right? And fasting is a pillar of our religion, right? It's one of the five pillars. And the same is true for the other pillars, right? Prayer, 
you have to pray unless you're traveling, unless you're sick, unless you are menstruating or you have postpartum bleeding. There's like all these exceptions to like who has to pray. You have to give charity. You have to, unless you don't have enough money to give charity. And then you're actually eligible to receive charity, right? You have to go on the pilgrimage to Mecca. You have to, if you're financially able to do so, if you are physically fit enough to do so, and many people aren't. So that is not actually an obligation that is placed upon them. These are the pillars of our religion. And there is an exception to everyone except the Shahada. So this here, this verse that we're talking about, this tells us something very important about really what this religion is all about. God calls us to a high standard. And he calls us to things that are incredibly beneficial for us. If we do them, like we're the ones who benefit. But he knows we all have situations in our lives. And so he gives exceptions all the time. You will find that he is constantly giving exceptions, even when he lays out hard and fast rules. Okay, next verse. He says, Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guide for humanity with clear proofs of guidance and the standard to distinguish between right and wrong. So whoever is present this month, let them fast. But whoever is ill or on a journey, let them fast an equal number of days after Ramadan. Allah intends ease for you, not hardship, so that you may complete the prescribed period and proclaim the greatness of Allah for guiding you, and perhaps that you will be grateful. So again, he reiterates the exception. You know, it's almost like people get tripped up when like a, a rule giver gives them an exception. Like if I tell my son he can do something he's usually not allowed to do, like eat ice cream, he won't go and eat the ice cream right away. He'll look at me like, is this a test? You're, you're, you want to see if I'll actually go eat the ice cream. This is a test, isn't it? I like, have to say, no, really, like, you can have the ice cream. So Allah is reiterating the exception with it. You're like, really, like, if you get sick in the month of Ramadan, don't fast, right? If you have a medical condition where you can't fast without, like, taking medicine or, or seriously harming yourself, don't fast. So he's reiterating it again in this verse. And he mentions that Ramadan is the month of the Quran, right? It's not just a month of fasting. It is the month of the Quran. And this is really like the most egalitarian thing about Ramadan because not everyone can fast. And there are things to do to make up for that if you can't fast, but not everyone can fast. And I know from talking to the people who can't fast, it's a bummer. They actually don't like it. They wish that they could fast. They feel a little bit left out. But no one gets left out of hearing the Quran. There are, there's something called the Tarawih prayer. And anyone can go to the Tarawih prayer. Anyone can hear the entirety of the Quran recited in the month of Ramadan. And you can attain the blessing of hearing that recitation. That's open to everyone. Right. And really what this verse is doing is it's establishing that the point of all this, like whether you can fast or you can't fast, the point of all this is mercy. The point is mercy. The point is drawing near to God. So if you are taking advantage of this opportunity to draw near to God, then praise be to God. Then praise be to God. Right? And if you're fasting and you're not taking advantage of this opportunity to draw near to God, right? then there's something deficient in the fast. Okay, now this is like one of the most beautiful verses in the Quran. He says, when my servants ask you, O prophet, about me, I am truly near. I respond to one's prayers when they call upon me. So let them respond to me and believe in me perhaps they will be guided. Um, again, mercy. Like he's talking about something very difficult to do. And he's talking about mercy. Like this is the point of the fast, is to access that mercy from God. That's what it's all about. And he's saying, if my servants ask you about me, I am truly near. 
Now, think about the way the sentence is phrased. Um, the language actually mirrors what God is saying happens when you call upon him. It says, if they ask you about me, I am truly near. He doesn't say, if they ask you about me, then tell them I am truly near. Or then, you know, go to the people and let them know that I am truly near. No, there, there is no separation between the question and the response. And Allah is letting you know, I'm that close to you. I'm, I am that close to you. He tells us elsewhere, I mentioned this before, that I am closer to every one of us. I'm closer to you than your jugular vein. There is no separation between you and your Lord. So why is he mentioning this about the month of Ramadan? This is a reality that we get to access when we fast. And I'm like, I know I'm like dropping teaser after teaser. What, what do you mean by that, Will? Well, I'm going to tell you next week. Okay, so stay tuned. Come back. <laughs> All right, and I love this verse. Um, it makes me laugh. So bear with me. It's a long one, and it's not going to make sense at first, but I'll explain what's going on here after we get to the end of it. It has been made permissible for you to be intimate with your spouses during the nights preceding the fast. Your spouses are a garment for you as you are for them. Allah knows that you were deceiving yourselves. So he has accepted your repentance and pardoned you. So now you may be intimate with them and seek what Allah has prescribed for you. You may eat and drink until you see the light of dawn breaking the darkness of the night. Then complete the fast until nightfall. Do not be intimate with your spouses while you are secluded in the mosques. These are the limits set by God, so do not exceed them. This is how God makes his revelations clear to people so that they may become mindful of him. Okay, so uh, Allah knows that you were deceiving yourselves and he has accepted your repentance. What's going on here? What is he talking about? Well, when the prescription to fast Ramadan first came down, Part of that prescription was that there was to be no sexual relations between married couples for the whole month, right? Like right now, um, you, you can't eat, drink, you can't really consume anything, and you can't engage in sexual relations during the daytime, but all of that is on limits at night, right? But originally, sexual relations were forbidden for the whole month. And so what was happening? People were like, you know, sneaking out, doing a little sneaky sneak on the side. You know, they, <laughs> uh, they couldn't do it. They, they couldn't make it the whole month. I mean, it's a long time. So like, you know, Allah is saying, okay, I mean, this is the time of revelation. All right. So like this type of thing doesn't happen anymore. Like if we can't uphold God's commandments now, like there's not going to be a new rule that comes down. It's like, oh, I see eating is hard for you too. So like you can have a snack at the heart. That, that's not going to happen. Right. But, you know, at that time, like God could actually respond to situations and he would send revelation to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to do this. Right. So he's saying, like, look, I can tell this clearly is not going to work for you. And, you know, the point is not to make this hard on you. You already said in the other verse, I won't ease for you. I don't want hardship. So just forget about the whole no sexual relations for the whole month thing. Just do it at night. Like, just don't do it in the daytime while you're abstaining from food and drink. Right. So, again, like this theme of mercy, like comes up again and again and again, exception after exception after exception until you get to like an actual changing of the rules. Like the point here is to draw nearer to him. And I think I've reiterated that enough, but I want you all to have it firmly in mind um, as we begin to talk about like, how do you actually fast? Okay, so let's do a day in the life of a fasting person in Ramadan. So, The fast begins uh, when you start getting text messages that say Ramadan Mubarak. That's, what, that, that's how you know that Ramadan has started. Um, your phone starts blowing up. Um, you know, the, some announcement will go out. And really, you know, our advice is follow your local mosque wherever you pray. Really, wherever you will pray the Eid prayer, 
inshallah, uh, follow them. There's differences of opinion on how to do it. I may not get too much into that tonight, but um, just follow your local mosque. And what that means when you get the announcement, which will come at some point after sunset, the day before the first fast. When you get that announcement, that means the month has started because our days actually start at sunset. Now, why is this important to know, especially during Ramadan? Because that Tarawih prayer that I mentioned before, well, it's the first night of Ramadan. The first Tarawih prayer will be that night. Before you ever fast, the first Tarawih prayer will happen. And so if you intend to hear the entire Quran recited over the course of the month, go to the masjid that night, right? The other thing that you should be doing that night when you get the announcement is making a strong intention to fast for the entire month. Intention is a required aspect of worship, right? Any act of worship, like we have to have intentions for our prayers. We have to have intentions for our fast. We have to have intentions for our pilgrimages, right? The beauty in intentions is that we almost always never do what we're supposed to do to perfection, right? But what God looks at is our intentions, not the shortcomings in our actions. So it's very important to make a strong intention to fast the month of Ramadan for the entirety of the month and for the sake of God and to draw nearer to him and to attain his forgiveness and to attain his mercy and you know everything that you want to get out of this act of worship, that you make an actual intention for that. So that when you fall short, as we all do, that intention covers those shortcomings. Now, you wake up early, early, early the next morning. Don't wake up at Fajr. Don't wake up at Fajr. Wake up before Fajr. So Fajr is when the rays of the sun start to break the horizon and you can first see the light. Fajr is like a super obvious thing when you live in the desert because it's just, you know, horizon or as far as you can see. It's harder to tell when Fajr comes in if you live in the city, at least by looking at the sky. Most of us have apps nowadays that tell us when it is. But you don't want to wake up at Fajr because Fajr is the beginning of the fast. So what we do is we wake up before Fajr. I don't even know what time that is right now. Um, but you want to have a, what time? Six? Thank God for daylight savings time. Um, Alhamdulillah. So, yeah, uh, you want to have a meal before. And really, you want to make sure that you're hydrating, right? That's the main thing. Um, this is a, what's called a mustahab action. It's not required. You don't have to wake up to do this, but it is literally mustahab means beloved. Like God loves it when we do this and it's recommended from a religious standpoint is definitely recommended from like a practical physiological standpoint. You wanna have some food in your belly going into the fast and you want to be hydrated. So then the sun comes up and you're not eating food. You're not drinking drink. You're not uh, taking medicine. You're not doing any like sort of medical injections that you may have to do. You're really not putting anything into your body until the sun goes down, right? Which again is like why some people don't fast. They have medications they need to take during the day. And so they don't fast and that's okay, right? But if you are able to do this, this is how you do it. And you don't engage in sexual relations. Now people have questions about this. Like how close is the line here, like, can I give my wife a hug when she's leaving for work in the morning? Yes, you can. Um, you want to not really do anything sensual. You don't want to do anything that would like arouse that type of passion. So you can give your wife a kiss on the cheek or whatever you want to do. And, you know, as long as you're not sort of seeking out some sort of sensual experience with your partner, you're good. Don't worry about it. Um, but just that, that's really the line there that you don't want to cross. And you do this until the sun goes down. And when the sun goes down, uh, you know, hopefully on Tuesdays and Saturdays, you're here. 
breaking the fast with us. But wherever you are, you, uh, you usually break your fast. Everyone's going to be handing out dates. Like if you're at a mosque, if you're at a friend's home, there's dried dates. And this was the sunnah, this is the practice of the messenger of God, peace be upon him, to break his fast with three dates. He would use fresh dates, but those are harder to come by where we are. So we use dried dates. They store longer, so you can get them across the ocean. Or from California. Many of them come from California now. So you drink a little water, you break your fast with three dates, and then you pray. You pray maghrib. And if you're in a place like Tatlif or you're in a, a masjid that's serving dinner, then dinner will be served after the prayer. And it's like a really good time. Everyone's really happy because they, they're eating for the first time uh, throughout the day. And it just feels really good. It's a great experience. If you've never done it, make sure you do like one of your first fasts in a big community because it, it's really, um, uh, it's joyful. It's just really joyful. Okay, and then, you know, you're free to eat and drink whatever you want until the sun comes back up. You're good to go. Um, then the Tarawih prayer happens at night. It happens after the Isha prayer, right? The, the fifth prayer that we do throughout the year, fifth prayer of the day. You pray that. If you're in a mosque, they're going to start the Tarawih prayer right afterwards. Um, and please remember that that happens. The first time that I went for Isha during Ramadan, everyone stood back up to pray. And I was like, oh, there's, there's like another prayer. And then I was standing there for like 15 minutes, like looking around, like, why is he, <laughs> why is he doing this to us? Like, <laughs> so the imam will like recite Quran for like a while. And then you'll like go down uh, and you'll like, you'll bow, you'll prostrate, you'll come back up and then you'll do it all again because there's two rakats. Um, and it takes like 20 minutes to like get through like one unit of prayer. And then you do salam. And then I booked it after that. I didn't know what was going on. It's like, I'm out of here. This is really hard. My feet hurt. Um, and I, I had no idea. No one told me what tarawih was. So if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> All right. Um, and I know I'm going a little longer than we usually intend to go, but like, I want to make sure everyone has like a, a clear picture of how to fast this month. So let's talk about exemptions. Um, fasting is mandatory for every Muslim who is of age. Um, in Arabic, it's called mukallaf, really uh, someone who is morally accountable. We track that by whether or not you have hit puberty. You hit puberty and you're considered an adult according to our religion, right? So everything that a Muslim adult is accountable for is you're accountable for at that age. Um, every morally accountable Muslim who is free from menstrual or postpartum bleeding. So, um, you know, mothers who have recently given birth, um, women who are on their cycle are exempt from fasting. They don't have to do it. And for each category of person who does not have to fast, um, there is an expiation. There is something that you can do to basically participate in the fast so that you're not being left out of the blessings of the month. Um, so that's where we start. Now, if you are fasting, like if you're just, you intended to fast for the day, um, but something comes up and you want to know, like, can I break my fast for this? Uh, these are the things that you can interrupt your fast for. Travel. Like if for some reason you have to catch a flight, you got to drive across state um, unexpectedly or even expectedly, uh, travel exempts you from fasting. So you don't have to do it. Now, the reason for this originally was like they didn't have interstates and airplanes back at the time of Revelation, like traveling was actually a hardship, right? Like you were wandering through the desert. It was hot. Um, there were bandits out there. There were sandstorms. There were, your camel could die. You know, all kinds of things could happen, right? It was a hard thing to do. So traveling like excluded you or it exempted you from the fast. You didn't have to do it. Now, 
because that rule was in place, we actually don't say, well, because traveling is easier for us today, we, we have to fast. We don't say that. Whenever God gives us an exception to something, we take the exception. Now, you can choose not to. It is up to you. If you would like to continue your fast, you're more than welcome. Um, but just know that you know, if you have to drive across state, you can stop at McDonald's. Don't. It's terrible for you, but you can. If you're ill, so if you get sick, you do not have to fast. And I don't mean like you have an illness where you need to be taking medication every day and like fasting is just not possible for you. But you, you catch the latest variant of COVID during Ramadan, inshallah, that doesn't happen. Allah protects all of us. You catch the common cold, you catch whatever and you fall sick, you don't have to fast. We don't, uh, none of this ever uh, is supposed to harm us. So if fasting could potentially harm you, you stay away from it. You just give yourself the day off. Now, how sick is sick? How sick is sick? Because, you know, you might wonder. You're like, well, I don't know. Like, my nose is running. I feel congested. Can I take the day off from fasting? I don't, I don't have a fever. I'm not nauseous. So where do I stand? Um, there was a story I read once uh, about, this was in Andalusia, this was Muslim Spain, uh, about a scholar from the Maghreb, from Morocco, who was visiting another scholar in Andalusia. And it was during Ramadan that he was making this visit. And he, he was staying with this man, and he noticed that he was eating during the daytime, like with the, the guy who wasn't traveling, was eating during the daytime. And he asked him, you know, in like a polite way, he was like, I noticed that you're eating and there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with you. Why is that? And the guy, I say, I'm saying the guy, he was a scholar of this religion. He responds, oh, I, um, I stubbed my finger today on the door. I stubbed my finger on the door. Like I just jammed it a little bit. And so I decided to take the day off from fasting. Now, I first read this and I was like, that seems like a little bit of a stretch. I don't know about that. Um, but this, uh, this man was like a scholar of the religion. He was someone who had devoted his life to it. Um, and you know, I, upon thinking about it more, what I realized is what he was doing. And this is something that you will actually see recommended. Whenever Allah opens the door for mercy, uh, you ought to walk through it. Like, take advantage of the mercy that God is offering you. Don't, you know, like, don't say, no, I'm good, right? You can. That, like, you're not required to stop your fast because you stub your finger. But because he had that opportunity, it was like, this is an extra mercy on top of this month of mercy that I'm already enjoying. I'm going to take it. It's like, I've already given you a million dollars, but would you like 100,000? You know, like, would you say no to that? I wouldn't, you know, that's kind of like the situation here. So if you are sick at all, like you stub your finger, uh, your wife looks at you the wrong way. No, I'm kidding. Um, but like, you know, it, it can be the slightest thing. Um, and, you know, if you feel like you need to take that day off, take it off. Uh, the elderly, you know, the, uh, you reach a certain age where it just, it really, really exerts you to the point of exhaustion uh, to fast, that you don't have to fast. What's amazing, like, you know, th this month, there's so many things about this month that like just blow me away. It's amazing to me that you actually still see a lot of elderly people fasting. And it's like, you know, you, you got the exit. You know, you could totally take this month off and chill. Like you could just feed a person like each day and you'd be good, but they do it. Why? Because they've been fasting their whole lives and they love it. They, they love what it does to them. They love how their connection with their Lord increases. It's clear. So a lot of people continue, right? But that is there. Like you, again, you're not supposed to hurt yourself in any way. Harm is something that we avert at all costs. So the elderly are exempt from fasting. Uh, pregnant women are exempt from fasting. This is another group of people that you will also sometimes see still fast. 
My wife did it. Um, you know, she tried it out one day when she was pregnant with our first son, and she was like, yeah, you know, it actually went okay. And I talked to the doctor, and they said, yeah, you know, as long as you, like, really hydrate at night and, like, get a lot of nutrients, like, you should be okay. She did it. And alhamdulillah, it went great. But, you know, you're eating for two. And every pregnancy is different. You know, some women get a whole lot hungrier than others. So, you know, that is there for you if, um, if you're pregnant or if you're breastfeeding. Um, and this is actually, you know, for us, this was tougher than being pregnant. Um, it's because, you know, you have to like maintain a milk supply for the baby. And that actually requires like a lot of food consumption and a lot of staying hydrated, right? Because you're producing liquids. Um, so breastfeeding mothers are exempt from fasting as well. So let's talk about the expiations for each of these groups of people. Um, for someone who is traveling, you just make up those days that you missed after the month of Ramadan. You just make them up at a later time. If you are ill, meaning like if you have a sickness that you don't usually have, if you're not uh, having to take some sort of like medication or like fasting would seriously harm you because of an ongoing ailment, right? It's just a passing illness. Then the expiation is to do the makeup fasts. You just make it up after the month of Ramadan. Um, if you are someone who cannot fast at all because of a medical condition, your expiation is to feed uh, a person for every day that you don't fast. So you feed 29, 30 people, you've fulfilled your expiation for the month. How much should you feed them? Uh, really, you know, you should feed them a meal that you would like to receive. Like Allah said that in the verses of the Quran that we mentioned, he said, provide the expiation, but if you provide more, it is better for you, right? Provide people with a meal that you would like to eat. Uh, but if let's say, you're ill and you're also in a financially tight situation. Like what's the minimum, right? It is 0.51 liters of the staple grain of the area that you live in. So we're in the Midwest. I think that makes it corn for us. So I, you know, I would hate to take someone 0.51 liters of corn um, and say, you're welcome, enjoy your meal. But like, if you have to do the bare minimum, that's what it is. Half a liter of the staple grain um, of the area that you come from. Uh, if you're pregnant, you do makeup fasts. And uh, if you are breastfeeding, you do makeup fasts and the minor expiation. So you feed a person for every day that you're not fasting, and then you later make those days up. Now, I already hear the question coming. That's a lot of makeup fasts. Like you're pregnant, then you give birth, like you have postpartum bleeding, you're like, you're nursing for like, some people nurse up to two years. That's a lot of makeup fasts. That's like three months of fasting. Um, well, you know, you don't have to do it all at once. Like the makeup doesn't have to be consecutive, first of all. So you can kind of like space it out, right? Um, but you know what is happening is like you are you are still trying to avail yourself of the blessing of that month so you know we talk about it we talk about like the expiation it sounds very serious like you're expiating something so what did you do you know you didn't do anything right you did nothing wrong but you are finding your way into the blessing of the month of ramadan um, and so that can be spaced out at your own pace. Now, let's talk about the really hard one, the major expiation. Don't ever have to do the major expiation, please. The major expiation is for intentionally not fasting when you have no reason <laughs> not to fast. So you have none of the excuses that I just mentioned. And you just decide, uh, I don't know. It's a nice day out. I'd love to go get a cup of coffee. That's what my nuff says to me when I'm fasting. Um, and then you do it. There is an expiation for that. And the expiation is 60 days of consecutive fasting. 
It's not worth it. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. All right, it's two Ramadans. Just don't, don't do it. Um, and that includes, you know, eating, drinking, sexual relations, any of that that you do during the daytime, during the month of Ramadan, on purpose, without excuse. Um, you know, uh, that requires a major expiation. Uh, so, okay, what's the exception to the major expiation? Because again, there are exceptions to everything. Uh, and I don't want to freak anyone out, especially those who may be looking at fasting for the first time, right? So if you are fasting for the first time, or maybe even the second or the third time, right, your body is still adjusting to depriving yourself of food and water, okay? And you're an adult, like you're used to eating and drinking every day, right? Um, so again, like, Go easy on yourself. The point of this is not hardship, right? Like if you make it to day three and you feel like you're not going to make it through day four, don't fast day four. Fast day five, you know? Get back on the horse, right? You know, push yourself a little bit, but find where your limit is so you know where to push, right? Um, this, I mean, there's literally like a term in our Sharia for this. It's called a rosa. It's like a license. Like someone who embraces the religion as an adult, they have a license for like adapting to the fast, right? So this isn't like, you know, my, like I feel bad for you guys, you know, and I just want to like give you an easy way out. No, this is a real thing. It's a real thing. Um, but again, like you're not to harm yourself. That's something that we do not do in this religion. We don't harm ourselves. So if you get to the point where fasting is going to harm you, don't fast, right? And take the time to rest up and then come back, try again and see how far you can go. But don't harm yourself. Take another day off if you need it. I think you guys see where I'm going with this. So again, God lets us know where the standard is so we know that what, we know what we're shooting for, right? We have to have the standards so we know what direction we're going in. But we get there by doing things that we can do consistently, right? The Prophet ﷺ told us that these are the most beloved actions to God, the ones that we can do consistently. So you don't say like, all right, I'm going to fast every day of Ramadan and I'm going to be so good at this. I'm going to fast every day of the following month. And you get to the point where you just completely burn yourself out and you say, oh, I'm never going to fast again because that was terrible, <laughs> right? You don't do that. You do what you can do consistently and then you push that boundary and you, you slowly start to grow. This is true with our prayer too, right? What, what prayers are going to be easy for you to pray throughout the day? Start doing those and get really good at them. And then find one that's not so easy to do throughout the day and start doing it. And it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to like figure out how do I adapt this? How do I fit this into my schedule? But eventually you figure that out and you just keep adding. That is most beloved to God, not overloading yourself. Okay. Um, man, this is, uh, this is like one of our old classes where I go for the full hour. Uh, last thing I want to say, so Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. It's not all about fasting. It is the month of the Qur'an. So I just want to say something very quickly about that. I already mentioned the Tarawih prayer, where you can hear the entire book recited over the course of the month. Take advantage of that. But I'll read you um, a couple of hadith, and I'll tell you about the last thing in Ramadan that you definitely need to know about. So the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, the scriptures of Abraham, upon him be peace, were revealed on the first night of Ramadan. The Torah was revealed after six nights of Ramadan had passed. The gospel was revealed after 13 nights of Ramadan had passed. And the Quran was revealed after 24 nights of Ramadan had passed. So this is the month of revelation. And you're like, great, it's, we're going to celebrate a bunch of books. No. This is the month where God literally reached down, reaches down from heaven to us. Like he reaches out to us and says, I want you to know who I am. I want you to live a life in devotion to me. I want us to have a relationship 
That's what this month is about. It's the month of revelation, right? It's the month where God establishes that again and again and again and again. And, you know, what did we say about the very first revelation in the very first class, right? God says, Iqra, bismi rabbik aladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq. Recite in the name of your Lord who created, who created humanity from an alaq, which is the, uh, the fetus, the, the embryo, I should say. It's the embryo. God is invoking in the very first thing that he has to say to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the very first thing that he has to say in the final revelation to all of humanity, he's invoking this image of a mother's relationship to her child. Right? And that's framing the entire revelation. He's saying, I want this with each and every one of you. Right? And this is the month in which that revelation came down. So that really is what the month is about. Um, so connect with that in your fast, in your worship. That's really what this is all about. Now, what's the best time in Ramadan to make that connection? There is a night, and we call it Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, uh, the night of destiny, or the night of power, or the night of decree. Um, we don't actually know when this is, but we search for it. Um, usually, I think the strongest opinion is, it, is that it's on one of the odd nights in the last 10 nights of the month. So like on the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, 27th, 29th, people will make sure that they are in the masjid, praying extra prayers, looking for this night. What does Allah say that, about this night? that it is better than a thousand months, that worshiping in this night is better than worship for a thousand months. Um, I don't know if we have any math whizzes in the room, but if you do the math on that, that equates to about 81 or 82 years, which is like a lifetime, right? Worship on this night is better than the worship of an entire lifetime on other nights. Right? So we seek it out because God is looking for us on that night. And so we go looking for God. Right? We seek out that relationship. Finally, um, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, would review the Quran every year in Ramadan. And he reviewed it twice in the year that he passed. The Prophet would seek spiritual retreat in the mosque for 10 days every year. And he secluded himself for 20 days in the year that he passed. Um, so this is pointing to the sort of the last practice, the last piece of worship um, that I'll point out for this discussion. And this is known as etikaf. Etikaf. This is secluding yourself in the masjid or in your home. It can be done in both places. But, you know, people will actually take off of work and they will devote themselves solely to worship. Uh, in these last 10 days. And this is something that you can do. If you go to the mosque uh, during those last 10 nights, oftentimes you'll like see sleeping bags along the wall. That's because people are making itikaf. They're, they're doing uh, seclusion in the mosque and they're actually living there for the last 10 nights. Uh, so that is something that we do too. I think most of us are pretty young. We have strenuous work schedules, but you know, inshallah, uh, retirement is out there and we'll get to make etikaf one day. Um, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So that, that's it. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Wal asr in al-insana la fi khusr. Ila ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawassal bil-haqi wa tawassal bi-sabr. Ameen.